All right, hello and welcome back to another episode of Just a Girl from Cleveland. This is episode 138. It is officially the week of the Super Bowl, the final week of football season. I will be crying for weeks on end after <laughs> this game is over. Uh, always sad to see the football season go, but the great thing about football is that the ecosystem of football is constant. It never ends. It never stops. There is always a new headline, a new article, a new coaching hire, just something interesting that's going to pull you in literally every single day um, that feeds us throughout the entire off season. So, uh, I mean, even this, this past week, there was a, a announcement about the Eagles playing a Friday game the first week of the season in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, so that first week we'll have Thursday night, Friday night, and then Sunday and Monday. Uh, so we're just filling up all the days of the week now. But the interesting thing about that Eagles game from a Browns perspective is that there is actually a de decent chance that that will be against the Browns in Brazil. Um, Cause if you look at the schedule breakdown, it's going to be a home game for them. They have nine home games this upcoming season. Um, so it's probably not going to be one of their division matchups. Um, so that kind of takes away a couple of the games. I think they have a few opponents that have other international games. And sometimes it's hard to believe that they would give a team multiple international games unless you are the Jacksonville Jaguars who um, are like on their way to becoming an international team at this point. Um, so there, there is a high possibility that the Browns could be playing the Eagles in Brazil. Um, to be honest, I hope that's not the case because I would like to go to Philly for the Browns Eagles game. So I'm hoping they don't move it to Brazil, but it would be interesting for sure. Look, I am, I'm all for the international games. I think it's great to try to grow the game internationally, introduce it to new markets, um, just continue to feed the monster that is the National Football League. Um, but sometimes there's so many that I'm like, mm, I want to, I want to see that game here and I want to go to it here and I don't uh, I don't want to have to buy an expensive plane ticket to go further than that so uh, we will have to see um, we won't know until the usually second week um, first or second week of May um, that's when they announce the you know schedule times weeks all of that good stuff so um, I, we always have that to look forward to. It's one of my favorite days of the year is the NFL schedule release day because it's all pure anticipation and excitement for something that has not broken your heart yet or ruined your life in any way. It's just all happiness and, and vibes. So uh, it's a great week. Um, okay, so today um, I want to get into a couple of random topics. I feel like I kind of covered my thoughts on the Super Bowl mostly last week, um, but I do want to get into my thoughts on the Super Bowl from a betting perspective. Um, the lines for the game are obviously out there and, and all of the different player props are, are out there as well. Um, they come out a lot earlier in the playoffs and Super Bowl than they do during the regular season. I think in terms of like knowing injuries and just getting an understanding of what's happening each week. I think it's a little different during the regular season. Um, so those aren't usually available to me when I go to record this podcast early on in the week. Um, that's not the case for the Super Bowl. So I want to get into some of my bets uh, that I have placed for the Super Bowl. And look, I'm, I'm not telling you in any way, shape or form to go out there and spend your money. It's just a fun thing to do. I don't put a lot of money on bets. I do it more just for having a good time and being able to root for something random to happen. I don't uh, recommend ever putting, you know, a lot into that. It's more just uh, for the fun of the game. So I'm going to share some of that with you. I also want to talk a little bit of Cavs basketball. Uh, that is a interestingly hot topic in the, the national world at the moment. And then I also want to talk about Ken Dorsey's press conference. He and Kevin both spoke to the media. I thought there were some really interesting takeaways from both of them speaking, as well as just uh, more direction, I think, on what this team is going to, to look like from a coaching perspective going forward. Obviously, I think Kevin is always going to be 
somewhat vague and not 100% answer all the questions as he should. Like, I don't think he needs to hear on February 6th. I don't need to know all of the answers about what the Browns offense is going to look like in September. Um, so I think it's okay for them to take some time on some things. But uh, I do think we got some interesting insight from them that I want to get into as well. Okay, so let's start with the Cavs. So I, I, I got slightly nervous today because I have started seeing a lot of national praise for the Cavs and immediately as a Cleveland fan, when that happens, I get scared and think that everyone's jinxing us and that it's all just going to implode. Um, I saw a tweet today specifically from Woj um, that just made me feel that way. He said, the Cavaliers are 14 and one in their past 15 games tied for their best record over a 15 game span in franchise history. It's also the best record over a 15 game span without LeBron James on Ross on the roster in franchise history. The Cavs are 32 and 16 and second in the East. Now they really just jumped up to second in the East out of nowhere. It felt like they were around five, four for a while. Um, just kind of hanging around there with the Knicks and then suddenly they're in second. They're on this incredible win streak and uh, it's to the point where everyone in the national world has to acknowledge it. I felt like people were slightly ignoring the Cavs, which I honestly don't mind. That's I don't need everyone to um, hop on board randomly and then tear us down at some point. So sometimes it's better when things are a little bit quieter. Um, but I felt like everyone was quiet with the Cavs because of the Mobley and Garland injuries. I think a lot of people immediately, immediately looked away because they were like, there's no way this team keeps it together. Like it's probably going to fall apart. They're probably going to look at trading Donovan Mitchell. And this is kind of a lost season. And it ended up being the complete opposite of that. The team has lost one game since in 2024 and it's February 6th now, um, just playing incredibly incredible basketball um and I just have had a great time watching them I think um you know from a coaching perspective I think JB deserves his flowers for what he has done with this team I know early on in the season people were ready to fire him and, and this is what tells you that fire the coach arguments are such scapegoat arguments like I do think there are times when they are valid but it is such a scapegoat argument most of the time um, because people wanted to fire JB and now it looks like he is in the running for coach of the year with what he has done with this roster, losing Evan, losing Darius, uh, just taking other guys and fitting them so seamlessly into this rotation, uh, I think has been a really beautiful thing. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for it. Um, if you're going to, you know, criticize him when things are bad, you got to give him the praise when things are good as well. Um, I went to the, the Kings Cavs game last night and um, I, I've gotten to a good amount of games so far this season, but this one in particular was really, I just feel like really highlighted what the Cavs have done so well this year in comparison to other years. And this, in terms of shooting, was an extra exceptional performance. They have not been doing this in every single game, but they were 56.1% from three-point range, making 23 of their 41 attempts. So as a team, 56.1% from three. Insane. The, the 23 made baskets from um, three was a a season tied for a season high. I believe that they're averaging, I think I looked earlier, it was around 13.4 threes per game this season. So um, this was, uh, you know, exponentially higher than that. Um, and just being able to make them at such a high percentage is really, really impressive. Um, and it was coming from so many different directions. I kept looking up at the screen at the, the box score and just felt like it was fairly even throughout the course of the game that so many different guys were contributing at any point in time and you've got guys on minutes restrictions still so I think that's you know a, a tough game sometimes of figuring out when do you certain guys like Evan Mobley or like when do I have him out there when do I take him out you know what's the most valuable time to be using him and you know you want to get him acclimated and comfortable in certain rotations again and you want to see what certain rotations look like so JB has done a nice job, I feel like, of balancing all of that, of testing out rotations while also making sure we're trying to win basketball games still. Um, I think it's a it's a tough game. 
to play. So overall, I I just don't even know what to say about this team at this point because they're just not losing. It's very um, exciting to watch. I hope to God they're not peaking too early and that you know April rolls around and things have slowed down drastically. I think the All Star break is going to be a real test here in a couple of weeks. Um, just in terms of having that time off and coming back, do they still have this intense energy that they have had throughout um, these last couple of weeks? I, I'll be really curious to see about that. But um, overall, it's been it's been fun. Okay, let's get into the Ken Dorsey press conference now. So <clears throat> it started off more with Kevin um, kind of introducing Ken and speaking on a couple of the other coaching things that have happened. Um, you know, acknowledge the guys that he had let go and just, you know, really simple statements of thanking them for their time with the organization. They contributed a lot, yada, 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 all that good stuff. Um, I think the big one I think people were curious to hear him speak on was Bill Callahan, who obviously um, has gone to work with his son in Tennessee, Brian Callahan. Um, and this was the quote from Kevin. He said, Bill Callahan, very unique situation there to go work for Brian, not with Brian. He's going to work for Brian. I can't wait for Brian to boss him around. The dream of every kid is to boss their parents around. So happy for those guys. Again, I think organizationally we re realized that's a unique situation and did not want to stand in the way of that. So excited for certainly Brian and Bill down there. So first of all, just like kind of a funny statement of like, oh yeah, his he's going to go get bossed around by his son. But um, I think in general that is a pretty fair statement to make. I saw some weird criticism on the internet for the Browns moving, on, like let, allowing Bill Callahan to leave, which I thought was really strange because I have no idea why they would say no to that. It would be a really bad look to be like, no, you can't go work with your son once in a lifetime opportunity. I think it would look bad to agents. It would look bad to other coaches. Um, you want to show that you care as an organization. And I think it made complete sense for them to do that. Connections are, are extremely important in this league, so it really was the only option. Um, I also think as incredible as I think Bill Callahan has been for this team, everything he has done, I mentioned this last week, this is maybe a time to start, you know, getting some new innovative minds continuing to work in this building. Um, Bill knows what he does. He's probably very comfortable with what he does and is not open to change as much. So maybe you use this as an opportunity um, to see what has been going wrong with the offensive line and the run game and, you know, use this as a chance to fix that. So I don't think this has to be an all bad thing that we have to act like. Once again, people like to act like the Browns are some, you know, idiotic organization that doesn't know what they're doing. And I think, you know, this makes complete sense and you know hopefully they're looking at it as a way to make positive change within this team um of course another question the biggest question i think that both kevin and ken were asked about was play calling so i'm just going to read what both of their answers were to that kevin said play calling which i know everyone wants to talk about we'll get there it's february 5th what's most important what i'm looking forward to the most is putting this offense back together with Ken really leading the charge. And that's why he's here and really pleased to have him here. And then Ken Dorsey to the question about play calling said, play calling to me is not as important as winning football games. To me, it's more about, all right, what's the de decision that we feel most comfortable about moving forward to help our team win? And I've been in my career more interested about, okay, what can I do to help this team win more so than anything else? And that's the only thing that matters to me. So pretty non-committal answers in general, which I figured, like I said, and like Kevin said, it's February 5th, 6th when I'm recording this. Those questions don't need to be answered at this moment. I think it's, you know, getting them acclimated, getting Ken acclimated in the building, in the quarterback room with the offensive, you know, play co or offensive coaches, the players on the offense, everyone in the organization. And then you can decide from there what the right move is. Um... I, so I'm not surprised that they were super non-committal on it. Um, but I did like his his answer about play calling to me is not as important as winning football games. I think you need the mindsets in there that the goal is just to maximize this quarterback that you have on this team that has not been maximized yet and figure out a way to make this offense run efficiently with him. I think that's the goal of everyone. And it's good to hear that just coming from uh, coming from both of them. Um, 
I think another takeaway I had kind of in relation to this is that it is extremely clear to me based on some of the quotes that Ken Dorsey was brought in specifically to help Deshaun Watson. Here was one quote that I thought was um, important from him. He said, on top of it, when you're watching tape, and again, I wasn't involved in the offense the pa in the past, but when you watch it, there are little intricacies of the position, whether he's adjusting protections or making checks at the line of scrimmage and things like that, you really kind of see pop up. So just from the outside looking in, the ability to kind of handle the offense and do different things, I think is really impressive. Um, so that was him kind of specifically referring to what he liked about Deshaun Watson. Um, and he spoke more also about two other quarterbacks that he's worked with in the past, Josh Allen and Cam Newton. Um, and just his understanding of working with quarterbacks that have these certain skill sets and how you can maximize them and, you know, limit the mistakes that they have, but also being okay with some of those mistakes. Obviously, I think, you know, you can have a safe offense that runs very efficiently and you're not turning the ball a lot over. Um, but the goal, I think, of a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL now with a makeup like a Josh Allen, um, who he has worked with, is you're going to turn the ball over, but you're going to do some incredible things. And so we want to maximize those amazing things. Well, hopefully, you know, minimizing the turnovers as much as you can, um, but still knowing they're going to happen and be okay with it. And I think that's kind of the mindset that he also talked about um, hoping to have with Deshaun Watson is bringing out those really good sides of him as a player, um, the sides that you saw from him in Houston and the things he could do really well um, that he hasn't really shown in Cleveland yet. Um, I think it's very clear to me that the goal of this organization and bringing Ken Dorsey in is to work with Deshaun Watson to do just that. He referred to him being in the quarterback room multiple times, like throughout the entirety of this press conference, he was like, and us in the quarterback room, us in the quarterback room, like this is, he obviously I know he he played that but he's referring it into him in in terms of like coaching so I think it is um it's pretty clear to me that they said hey we need you to get this guy to work again to to fix this guy in, in a way um and, and not even I, I don't I don't want to say that in even like a mean way it's just like he has not been the quarterback that he had proved to be before this. And we need you to bring out these sides of him and get him to be, um, you know, the best version of Deshaun Watson possible. So uh, I definitely like the sounds of that. Um, hoping we get to see that in the coming year. Um, another takeaway I had, I think, is that they are not going to be just completely reinventing the wheel, you know, making improvements and maximizing kind of like I just talked about there. Uh, this was one quote from him. All right, he said, I mean, you watch this offense on film and there are a lot of exciting things about it, not only from a player standpoint, but what we're doing and creativity and different ways to attack a defense standpoint. So I think there's a lot of exciting things that we've done. And then obviously every year, whether it's me coming in new this year, but every year you look to evolve and evaluate and change. Hey, do we like this? No, take it out. Do we want to add this? Yes, add it. You know what I mean? There's always that evolution that you look to try to stay ahead of the curve. So that's going to happen, um, which I, I really like that mindset. I think Kevin has laid a great foundation here. I do not think we need to, someone to come in and completely shake everything up. We need someone to come in that has the same goals and the same focus as the rest of the organization and just wants to get them to where they need to be, which doesn't you know mean doing anything too crazy. Um, like I said, just really maximizing what they already have. Um, the last big thing, I think he was extremely complimentary of the offensive line, which I thought was interesting because I think in general, the fan base and, and everyone really has been a little bit more critical of this offensive line, um, just for the last year or so, I would say, and in terms of, I don't think they have been the top offensive line in the league that they were for so many years and, and talked about it like that in a national way. Um, but this was the quote from him. He said, you can't help but get jacked up about this opportunity because of those guys up front. You watch them on tape and you can't help but get excited about the guys that we got up there and what they're able to do because they, they're diverse in what they can do. To your point, you got a group of guys that can pull. You got a group of guys that can be zone blocking scheme guys. You got a group, group of guys that could come out and get movement at the point of attack in gap schemes and duo schemes. So that's the exciting part for me in terms of scheme moving forward. I think that's why it's so important. 
important. Um, so just really complimentary of, I think, really the foundation that Bill Callahan laid for what this offensive line does. Um, but obviously good that I think he still sees the talent there. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like in terms of Bill Callahan leaving, to kind of go back to that, we have some veterans on this offensive line that know what they're doing and know the culture I think that is set in that position group at this point. So I don't think um, Bill has to, leaving has to be anything too crazy because those guys are leaders within themselves. Um, but I, I just thought that was interesting for him to highlight that specifically. Um, and look, I, there's still a lot of talent there, obviously. Like they drafted Dewan Jones, who you know we took in the fourth round, but is probably a first round talent. And he got hurt at you know towards the end of the season and wasn't able to continue. Um, so you expect to see big things from him in the future. Uh, you still got Betonio, you know, potential Hall of Famer there. So there's still a lot of talent there. I think it's just um, making it work in a better way this season with the run game, I think is going to be the really important thing to see. Okay, so that's all I have on the Ken Dorsey press conference. Let's talk some Super Bowl bets. Um, so like I said, usually don't get to do this, so I'm kind of excited. Um, we're going to start with some Travis Kelsey bets because in honor of my girl Taylor Swift announcing her new album coming out in April, very excited about this, we had to do some Travis Kelsey bets because all things are coming out, Taylor and Travis, so that's the direction I am going with the betting markets. I picked a long shot one and then I picked a more lower stakes one that I kind of liked. Um, so the, the long shot one is Travis Kelsey, two plus touchdowns. And I made all these bets on Fandle, by the way. So odds could be different elsewhere. But when I made the Travis Kelsey, two plus touchdowns bet, that was plus 700. Um, look, he's been scoring in like every single game in the play playoffs, at least one. Um, so I, I just have a feeling if the Chiefs win this game, Travis Kelsey is going to be a massive part of why they do that. Um, and I can see in these moments that matter most Patrick is going to trust him um and specifically in the red zone so I have Travis Kelsey two plus touchdowns plus 700 the lower stakes one Travis Kelsey plus 155 to have six plus receptions and 90 plus yards um with Baltimore this past week he had 11 receptions and 116 yards the two weeks before that it was um a little bit lower on the receptions and yards but still you know put up decent numbers um I just kind of go back to the same reason on the two plus touchdowns I think that Patrick trusts him in these moments and I just see him having a, a big game so that's just a just a little one there plus 155 for those two amounts parlayed together but I like it then on the um 49ers side we have a nice long shot parlay here, plus 683. There's four things in this parlay. We've got a Christian McCaffrey anytime touchdown, self-explanatory. He's in the end zone constantly. Like I, that one to me is, is easy to put in. Debo, 50 plus receiving yards. I think Debo, anytime he is inactive, it is a clear miss in this 49ers offense. I think he is so important to what they do. Um, so I am putting him at 50 plus, um, receiving yards. And then we have two chiefs parts as a part of this part lay, uh, MVS for 25 plus receiving yards. I think he's going to have like one long one in the game, just like a nice long throw from Patrick Mahomes. He had that great catch in the Baltimore game. I think it happens often where he, um, and in this this these playoffs where he has had big moments i think he had one in the playoffs last year as well where there was a big moment um and really makes up for i think a couple of the misses that he's had he has some moments that chief fans are not happy about so I, I could see him having like one big moment that's you know a decent length catch in this game and then i have pacheco 60 plus rushing yards i just I like betting him because I just like the way he runs and I think he's fun to watch. So I'm throwing that in there too. So those four parlayed together plus 683. And then a one last fun one that is not specific to any players, but is plus 800. So a long shot, but it doesn't feel that crazy to say. I have 49ers to win the first half and Chiefs to win the game plus 800. If you believe in Patrick Mahomes comebacks, 
I think this is a fun long shot bet. Um, you know, maybe the 49ers get some scores early, um, but then the Chiefs defense starts getting some stops in the second half. Oh no, you know, it's a close game throughout. You give Patrick Mahomes the ball, he's making it happen. I just think that that is a, a strong possibility um, for this game. So we shall see. But like I said, bet responsibly. Don't do anything stupid, but just just throw a couple bucks on it just for the vibes, just to enjoy your Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, okay, so that is all I have. Next time I talk to you, the Super Bowl will be complete. The football season will be complete. Um, and we'll start getting into some off-season talk more. So um, thank you guys so much for listening. I appreciate you all being here. If you listen or watch on the YouTube, please subscribe. Please leave a comment, like it, all of that good stuff. I'd very much appreciate it. If you listen on Spotify, Apple, leave a rating or review, share with a friend, all of that good stuff. Thank you guys so much for listening. Enjoy this last week of the football season. Uh, and... As always, even though we have many, many months until we get to see them play again, go Browns.